I come to you over this microphone today to make an announcement. <clears throat> Don't go away. The God of the Bible, not the popular God of the vivid imaginations of this generation of confused men and women, but the God of the Bible, who at the same time is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, kills people. I'm coming to ask you in the next 18 minutes, will God who kills people, who threatens to do so, who plainly announces he will, who evinces his character by his wrath in killing people, cutting them off, will he have to kill you? There are two statements that I'd like to make that nobody can deny now. Nobody, wiseacre or humble. The first statement is this, that this is a day in the once Christian nation of America that now is a pagan society. This is a day of armed, active hostility to the claims of God for his Son, Jesus Christ. This is a day when scientists announce that they believe in God and everybody claps their hands. This is a day when everybody believes in God, but not the God whose character is pictured and outlined and delineated in the Word of God. This generation is dead set against the God of the Bible because God will not resign from his throne, will not abdicate will not water down his demands nor his claims. The other statement that I wish to make is this, the most alarming fact of our day, your day, you who listen to me now, and my day as I speak to you, the most alarming fact of our day in America is that every time two people in America die these days, one of them dies suddenly. This has become the land of sudden death. Men and women do not uh, bring their children and loved ones about them like Jacob of old and make disposition of one's property and tell everybody goodbye and turn your face toward the wall and go to sleep with their fathers. But men start out to work and have an accident in a car and wake up in eternity. Men get on a plane and wake up in eternity. Men start to take a bath and wake up in eternity. This is the day of accidental death. Men die now without doing what they fondly said they'd do, take time out to pray. They die with no warning and no chance to pray. Men die today and never get the opportunity to do what they said all the days of our lives. Tomorrow I'm going to repent, but tomorrow comes, and instead of that being the time when you have space given you for repentance, that's the time that you have space given you to die. Men are always going to yield to the claims of God for this Lord, for his son Jesus Christ. But one half of the people of America die suddenly. We call it accidentally. But there are no accidents in the kingdom of God. Nothing happens that takes God by surprise. And there is a verse of scripture in the word of God. Then God's word reinforce this verse. There is a verse of scripture to which your attention is now called that explains it exactly what's happening in America, why America is now the land of sudden death. And that verse of Scripture is found in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, at chapter 29, and the verse is verse 1, and it reads like this, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. What's happening in America, in this nation, by men and women seeking a place to worship and serve God without compulsion. In this nation, where the gospel's been preached the length and breadth of the land, but this nation that's been smiled on by Almighty God as no other nation since time began, this nation that has been so wonderfully blessed of God and called of God, this nation has departed from the faith of our fathers and the God of the Bible and is blowing the smoke of its downright, outright rebellion and unbelief in the nostrils of a thrice holy God. And God is answering that awful rebellious lawless spirit 
by cutting men and women off. If you just stop to think of it, you may be one of the people that's going to be suddenly cut off and die suddenly and be hurled out yonder into the hands of a living God, for the Bible speaks the truth when it says it's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. Think with me this morning. Don't you go away. Don't you touch that dial. Don't you take out on me now. I'll need you to judgment with this warning from Almighty God's Word. He that being often reproved hardness his neck. You know what's going to happen to him? I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen to him. He's going to be suddenly cut off. He's going to be destroyed. He's going to be ruined in this life and damned in the next. And God's going to do it. And that destruction and that remedy is utterly, and that, that destruction is utterly without remedy. One out of two people in America die suddenly. Why? Because America's been rebuked. America's been reproved. You've been reproved by the Holy Spirit. For this verse of Scripture does teach us that God does reprove men. I'm not talking about the hot and talk in Africa that live way out in the jungle a long ways from the nearest dirt road. Oh, no. I'm not talking about the man who spends all the days of his sojourn here on this earth and never hears the name of God or the title of God or the precious name of Jesus, but I'm talking about you here in America with a church on every corner and one in between, with a Bible can be bought most of our five and ten cent stores, with the gospel on the radio and the television here in America where God's hand has been so blessedly upon us. I'm talking about you. God's reproved you. God has reproved you. He that being often reproved, but men meet that reproof by rebelling and hardening themselves. God always has been after sinners, and he hadn't quit in the list day. He was after sinners in Noah's day. He was warning sinners in the day of Noah. And bless God, he warns people today. Every time you go down on one of these freeways and traffic is stopped because of an accident and there's death. That's what I'm talking about over this radio right now. That didn't happen accidentally. That didn't happen. Somebody have to telephone God and tell him it took place. There are no accidents in the heart and mind and plan and purpose of God. I'm saying to you, those are warning signals put out there by a loving God who yet is thrice holy, who seeks to cause men to stop on their road that leads to destruction before they are plunged by their own sin into the abyss of eternal hell. Thank God. God does reprove sinners. I can't save anybody. I can't convince anybody. I can't turn anybody. I know that, but God can. And I'm so glad that God kept after me. I'm so glad God didn't give up on me. I'm so glad he hadn't given up on the human race. I'm so glad it seems that the more men spurn him and spit at him and scoff at him and deny him and have preachers deny the truths of the Word of God and make fun of the deity of Christ and put the Bible as an old scrapbook and junk morality and junk little Ten Commandments and blow their smoke in the face of God. I'm glad that in spite of that fact, God's Holy Spirit's still running down sinners and stabbing them in the hearts and reproving them of their ungodly conduct and warning them of a judgment in the hell to come and pointing them to cease reliance upon themselves and to cast all their confidence in the bloody Son of God hanging on a cross. God does reprove sinners, but you know how people in our day meet God's reproof? They harden themselves. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. God does the reproving and man does the harden. He spits on his hands and rolls up his sleeves and grits his teeth and said, God, not going to move me. I wouldn't mind being a church member and I don't mind being and converted, and I don't mind what to call being saved now, but God's not going to change me. God's not going to give me a heart of flesh. God's not going to plant a holy disposition in me. God's not going to start the work of making me like his son. I will not be changed, and I'm just going to fight this business. God thinks he's going to run my life. He's got another thing coming. That's how men talk 
today. Men harden themselves. Men harden. They can't be neutral, so they harden themselves. They, they can't get rid of God, so they harden themselves against the reproof. They say, well, I don't believe in God. But at night, when they go to bed and they wake up at night and scared, they'll pray to that God that don't believe in to keep them out of hell like I used to do before morning. Men harden themselves. Am I talking to you? Every time God comes and warns you, do you grit your teeth and spit in his face and go on down the road that leads to hell? You know, you have to harden yourself to do that. You have to harden yourself to do that. I know in Detroit, Michigan, one morning after I brought a message in an evangelistic campaign, the big old tabernacle, see a lot of people in the pulpit stand as mighty high, and I climbed down three little segments of stairs to get down to the bottom floor to shake hands with the people. And I shaking hands with people, and I felt something cu- tugging at my coat tail. And directly I looked down, there's a little two and a half, no, three and a half year old girl, curly, flaxen haired, beautiful little gift from heaven. And she crawled up into my arms, and when I got her in my arms, she put her little arms around my neck, and in her little old baby way, she began to cry. And she said, Oh, Bubba Barnum, said, I want my daddy to get saved. Oh, Bubba Barnett, I want my daddy to get saved. Bubba Barnett, I want my daddy to get saved. Now, the little girl didn't know exactly what it meant to be saved, but she knew that life in her home was hell, and she knew something needed to happen to her daddy and poor little old heart. She just broke my heart. And directly here came her mother, and she began to sob. She took the little baby out of my arms, and I said to the wife and mother, I said, I'll be on the radio this afternoon, 3 o'clock there in Detroit, and I I said, your husband cusses preachers and he cusses God and he's ordered me out of your home and he's ordered the pastor out of his home and he never darkened the door of an assembly of God anywhere and uh, he, he, he brags about how tough he is but I said, sometimes he will listen to the radio and I said, you make it convenient maybe he'll listen to me this afternoon and I'm going to preach to him and that afternoon over that radio I stopped out in the middle of my sermon and asked the audience to pardon me I said, I believe there's a man listening to the sound of my voice now and I believe God God sent him a last call this morning, and I told over that radio how that little three-and-a-half-year-old girl had come, climbed up my arm, put her arms around my neck, and cried out, oh, Bubba Barney, I want my daddy to get saved. I want my daddy to get saved. And I said, I believe the husband, that daddy, that little girl, listen to me now. And I said, you wouldn't listen to God. You haven't listened to any of his threats. You haven't listened to any of the pleas of your wife and the little child. You haven't listened to anybody. But I said, now, here's God talking to you through the tears and heartbreak of your little three and a half year old girl and I said the spark of manhood in you get out on your face and begin to repent of your sin cry to God for mercy you know what he did he got up and turned that radio off slammed his hat on his head opened the door and cursed me and cursed the radio and cursed God and cursed his wife and slammed out of there and went to the nearest honky tonk and in 20 minutes after he got out of the house a man had pumped five bullets in his body and you say God don't do something when men harden themselves against sin. You say, that is accidental. No, sir, bless the Lord. He that being often reproved hardens his neck. You know what's going to happen to him? Judgment's coming. God's going to get a hold of him. And he did that man. He kills people who harden themselves against him. The result of hardening yourself on the reproving, convicting, pleading, persuading power and person and presence of God in the Holy Ghost is sudden death. God warns. He said, I kill and I make alive. The scripture tells us about how God killing the people in the days of the flood. Scientists tell us as maybe as many people living on the earth in the days of the flood as live now. Nearly three million souls. And you know how many people God sent and sent to hell, killed and sent to hell. God did it. God did it. This God, this God you say you believe in, live like he does not exist. This God the preachers make fun of his holiness. This God who says, I warn you, I kill and make a lie. This God who's the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what he did? He wiped off the face of the earth, nearly three billion souls, one fell smooth, and sent them all to hell. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God that kills people. Is he going to have to kill you? The scriptures say, you keep on hardening yourself. You're going to get by not on your bottom dollar. No, I warn you, I warn you. God knows I wish I knew how to warn you.
God kills people. What kind of people does He kill? People who harden themselves when He calls to them. Like those people who listened to Noah and didn't pay any attention to Him for 120 years and God wiped them off the face of the earth. God kills people. I was in a city in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. I'll not name the town. It's called the richest small town in the world. The pastor came and asked me to hold meetings. And I got there on Sunday morning between Sunday school. You know what that is in church. We call it seven deacons of that church came to the pastor and said, Now, Brother Pastor, we're not going to oppose him, saying we believe, we, we just don't believe in this emotionalism. We don't believe in what you call evangelist campaigns. And said, We'll just not be back until this preacher's gone and the meetings are over. And the pastor said, Well, I hate to see you take that attitude, but if that's what you want to do, appreciate you coming and telling me. Well, you know, if they'd have done what they said they would, they, they would have been all right, but they, we, we, we couldn't get a crowd for a few nights, and we was hitting it pretty hard, and those fellows were glad, and they got to bragging about how we weren't getting anywhere in the meeting. They violated the word that they wasn't going to oppose us, and the pastor came to me, and he was brokenhearted, and he said, Brother Barnes, it's killing me. What can we do? I said, I don't know. Are you game for us to get down on our knees and ask God to save them or kill them? And he said, yes, I'm game. And we got down on our knees and said, Lord, you know what these fellows are doing. They run the meeting. They're making fun of the gospel and the church and the Lord Jesus Christ and God's preachers down and said they're just filling the whole town with a town about 10,000 people. Everybody gets bad news pretty soon. And everybody's talking about how the meeting is no good and those seven deacons making fun of it. And we said, Lord, save them or kill them. And somehow or another, I, I, neither one I was supposed to tell, and I don't think I did, but somebody did, and those deacons heard about it. But they they heard just half of it. And so they just cackled and they had a big time, said the preacher's up there praying for God to kill us. But we weren't praying for God to kill them. We were praying for God to save them or kill them, get them out of the way. They were bucking God. They were hardening themselves against God. And I think that's dangerous. And so they just laughed and had a big time. And in four days' time, the pastor had seven different funerals. And the seven different funerals were the funerals of those seven Baptist deacons, and every one of them died a horrible, sudden death. God kills people that harden themselves against his claims for Jesus Christ. You better quit making fun of Christ's church and Christ's gospel and Christ's people and Christ's Bible and Christ's spirit. You better quit spitting in the face of the truth of God, for God hardens people. God God kills people. God cuts people off who harden themselves against him. You know, I'm going to tell you the day when you're going to be cut off. Acts in the book of the Bible, book of Acts, at the 17th chapter and the 28th verse is a statement that's true of the preacher who speaks now and of everybody that listens to me. The Word of God says, For in him we live and move and have our being. You know what that means? That means that the man who's speaking to you now, I'm dependent on God for my next breath. That means you're dependent on God for your next breath. You know, one time God started all over again by sending the flood and wiping everybody off the face of the earth, but he's not going to have to go to all that trouble to cut you off. All God would have to do would just not give you the next breath. That's right. Our, our breath is in his hands. How does God cut people off? Well, he does it without any remedy. Oh, I'll meet you at the judgment. I'll meet you at the judgment. And you'll hear again my voice. And if you're sent to hell, thank God. I'm praying that you've heard. And that maybe somebody just a little bit scared. I tell you, I don't think it's nice to be sent to hell. But God says the wicked shall be cast into hell. Will you be one of them. You will be if you do not change from hardening yourself to surrender to God in Jesus Christ. Amen.